Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 158. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And we're crossing to Australia again today. Seems like we do this every couple of weeks at the moment, but the guest we've got on today, he lives in Australia now, but he's a British guy who everyone who grew up in the 80s in Britain will know Tony Takushi. What a legend. What a legend, indeed. You know, Mean Machines magazine and yeah. a CMVG as well. And, of course, Mighty Sega. Yeah, well, I mean, Tony was really... I mean, you mentioned Mean Machines. He was a guy that was really behind the idea of Mean Machines. And um, he was the first guy who kind of took to reviewing those Japanese consoles in British press. Because, I mean, you think about the mid-'80s, it was all Spectrums and Commodore 64s and that kind of thing. Computers really were the main thing here. And he was the guy who did, like, the first UK re- review of, like, the Mega Drive, for example, and the Neo Geo. And you remember when you were a kid reading about these Japanese consoles. Like, yeah. It seems so exciting. Imagine he was the guy that would sit there and get this before anybody else yeah. in the country and just be able to, like, form his opinion on it and shout it out there. And also, you know... He he worked on a few strange systems as well. Um, that was the uh, new one, which yeah. was uh, <laughs> which you seem to a, a talk DVD. About a lot. Yeah, oh, we're obsessed with the new one, aren't <laughs> we, we? We did mention it like every other episode recently. Now, this was that weird console that came out. When was it, like 2001? Yeah, yeah, and it was a lot of ex-Atari stuffers. Yeah, really, it was a follow-up to the Atari Jaguar, really. Um, the spiritual successor, Jeff Minter did games on there as well. And he actually convinced Tony to get involved with the new one and um, release a couple of titles for it. And he did one that was called Freefall 3050 AD. Now, have you ever played it? Uh, I've seen videos of it, but I've not had an opportunity to play it. But uh, all our listeners may be able to have an opportunity <laughs> to play it if you can answer the special question later on. Yeah, now we do have um, 30 codes to give away. I mean, this was a new one game. Um, that got really high praise at the time, but you and I, not being rich enough to afford a new one, the prices that, that go for on eBay these days. No, and it's just been released on Steam. Yeah. So you can actually play it on your PC now. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to get hold of a free code, he's given us about 30 to give away. So uh, all you've got to do is nip onto our website, theretrohour.com. Little question to answer there. Uh, we'll leave this open for two weeks. We'll close it on Friday, the 15th of February at midnight, and then we'll pick out 30 winners at random and uh, email you the codes so definitely get involved in that and listen out for our interview with Tony Takushi the legend coming up in around 15 minutes from now some really good chat about stuff that he saw when he was working at Sega like you know on the the Sonic 2 promotional tour and when he first saw Sonic the Hedgehog 1 that kind of stuff oh, hasn't he got like tons of merchandise as well like all the cool stuff and oh, rare... I, I can't wait for this interview it's great and he's got rare prototypes and yeah. stuff too so uh, yeah if you're a Sega fan definitely hang around for this one now before we get into our interview with Tony uh, a few news stories to talk about in a minute. Um, some really good stuff on the Atari scene at the start of 2019. And also, stream your original Game Boy to your TV. Now, we'll talk more about that in a minute after we give a big up to our donators. Now, these are the people who, it's thanks to them, that the Retro Hour podcast has continued into 2019. Totally. And we've had a little problem with our donations this week where we've had, had to kind of set it up uh, on a new site. Yep. So. We've got a new link to our PayPal, but uh, the crypto stuff's down at the moment. Uh, We'll be creating some new wallets for that and stuff. Yeah, but we've got a new website. So all you've got to do if you want to make a donation, um, there's a little tab at the top called Support. Click on that. There's a PayPal button in there. Dead easy. Um, All at theretrohour.com. And for making a donation of any amount, you will find your name in the very prestigious Retro Hour Hall of Fame and get a shout on a future episode. Just like this week. Matthew Martin. Kevin Lee. John Martorano. And Stuart Brand, who all made donations into the running of the show. And you can do the same at theretrohour.com. So let's talk about the Atari scene. I mean, it is actually one of the most active retro communities. And I know we're both massive fans of the Atari Age website, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Atari Age, if you don't know about it, it's a fantastic community. And they're kind of, they've been preserving games and uh, making sh- conversions for other systems. So stuff that's not been released on the 2600 could come out. But now... They're in the game of a uh, kind of Jaguar hardware and uh, new complete titles, which is absolutely crazy. Now, this is um, the Atari Age forums, really, where most of this stuff kind of happens. Uh, people often go on there, and they've got some really good, like, yeah, hardware creators and software developers. And we were talking, like, before Christmas, actually, about these new Atari Jaguar Pro controllers. Now, I got a pair of these. I mean, they're pretty good price, about 100 quid for two, which might sound pricey, but you get two of them in the box. And... Um, the original Atari Jaguar Pro controllers are so rare. Um, and they've got shoulder buttons and they've got like, you know, six fire buttons on there too. But also, I mean, looking through this page on here, they figured out how to connect a mouse 
yeah. to the Atari Jaguar. Yeah, so that might not seem massively important, but you, you can support ST and Amiga games in here. But what they've started doing is, do you remember Trackables, Dan? The... Yeah, I could never get on well with Trackables, but yeah, I remember yeah. they were quite popular. It was kind of like the mouse flipped upside down with a ball. Uh, well, they were great for playing loads of games, and they've actually released a whole new series of games that now support the Trackball. Wow. Okay. Which is fantastic. So you could actually get your Amiga or Atari mouse and start using that. And that's games like Centipede. But I'm also checking the releases out and it's amazing. There's like five games coming out for the 2600. You've got Defender of the Crown and Treasure Island Dizzy coming out for the Jaguar. Yeah, those have been on the forums for a, a couple of months now, actually, I think. they do. Cost, the way they do this is kind of pre-orders. And then, you know, people kind of say if they want a copy of it, put the name down. But the thing about it is you've got to get in there right at the beginning because if the print runs out That's and they're it, not making yeah. any more, the cost of fortune to get them off the market. Well, there's 7,800 two games here as well and they're even uh, 5,200 as well. Yeah, so. 5,200 games. Yeah, yeah. Mappy they've even converted to the Yeah, Atari. it seems like uh, <laughs> some of these are kind of conversions of other games. I, I, I wouldn't know how many original titles they are, but... They seem to be amazingly well done. And they're in original carts. You get manuals. This yeah. is uh, properly good. I, I'm loving it. I, I didn't know Atari was uh, really this popular <laughs> anymore. I thought that's great. Yeah, well, I saw Ravi eyeing up at Real Sports Curling. Oh, curling. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I've been playing curling in VR. And that is <laughs> that is really good use of VR. <laughs> yeah, you need to uh, make an adapter to wire up your like, Oculus Rift and play it on the Atari yeah. 2600. That's what you need to do. Uh, but yeah, it's great to see that the Atari scene is thriving. I mean, you know, I'm a massive fan of the Jag. I've always got a bit of a love for like, these like fail consoles, and the Jaguar is actually the only system I collect for. We need to go to an Atari event, or do you think we get chased out? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a really big one that happens every year. Um, if I can find a link to it, um, somewhere in like Europe, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they do like a thing called Jagfest every year. Okay, cool. And you go over there, and I mean, there's like it's ST and all that's represented there too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks really cool. I've, there's like a video tour that if I can find that, I'll put it in the show notes this week. But yeah, the Atari scene hotting up for 2019, which is brilliant to see. So, you want to hook your Game Boy up to a TV? How on earth would you do that? Well, you can do it wirelessly now. <laughs> this is crazy with the original Game Boy. So, um, have you heard as a H of a HID? HID, a HID. Yeah, a no, HID. Never heard of that. It's it's a little interface that can kind of act like a keyboard. You know, you know when you have your um, oh, what was it, Wii U? Yeah, and you had that kind of controller with the screen. That, right, okay. That's yeah. your that's your HID one. And what this guy's managed to do is he's managed to convert a cart on the original Game Boy so that it wirelessly transmits to a receiver to your television. Wow. Now, now this is absolutely <laughs> crazy. So it's actually wirelessly transmitting the Game Boy game signal directly uh, to your TV. And that's like you can get from 13 feet to 26 feet in kind of length with that which is not bad it's actually further than the wii u controller i think yeah <laughs> and you, you can build your own as well so he's put plans out there on how to kind of build these carts and uh you can do it your own or you can buy one now they've got transmitters and receivers which is crazy so they've got a game boy one that works with the game boy pocket advanced uh the sp uh, and they've got another one as well, which works with the DS as well, the wow. DS Lite. They've got now receivers as well um, for the GameCube, and they've got them also for the Super Nintendo. So uh, the receivers, they basically plug into um, the GameCube. In the video port? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, no, no, not in the video port, in the controller port. Right. And then you can use any controller with an A and B on it. Oh, wow. On your okay. GameCube, yeah. So there's two levels. There's transmitters to send to the television and receivers to receive crazy new controllers. This wireless future. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I remember back in the day, if you wanted to play GameCube games, you needed like the, um, you know, the, the Game Boy adapter for your Super Nintendo or something. Yeah. So it's cool that you, know, you don't have to hunt down that kind of expensive hardware now. And, and you can use like wireless pads. You can just, no cables kind of... Filling up the whole place. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the problems, I think, isn't it? It's like, whenever you look at, you know, your retro gaming setup, snaking cables everywhere, yeah. isn't it? And I've tried to tidy them up, but they never look good, do they? So I think anything that reduces cable clutter is a good thing. Well, also the fact that, you know, they're using the original hardware. This isn't like, yeah. oh, I've got a NES Mini and I'm doing it. It's like, I've got my NES and I'm actually 
sticking it in and playing a wireless controller with it. It's amazing. And the quality of like the, the streaming games to the TV from the GameCube look really good, actually, on this little video. Yeah, if you think well. about it, it's not got to send that much no. info over compared to what you can send over um, wireless now. It's crazy. I'm sure someone will mod it to output 4K or something from, from <laughs> yeah, a black and yeah. white Game Boy. Upscale it on the fly <laughs> or something. Now, before we get into our chat with Tony Takushi... Um, we love mini disc, don't we? Now that's got a lot of nostalgia for me—the mini disc format, listening to music. But before I got an iPod in the early two thousands, that's when I first got my lot mini disc Walkman. Had a, a stack system as well. Oh yeah, they were awesome. I remember there was a whole uh, bootleg thing on mini disc. My mate used to sellotape a microphone to his shoulder and go to gigs, <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> re- record all the music on mini disc and then bring it back. See, I mean, people forget. I mean, mini disc wasn't that popular in America, was it? But actually, it did have quite a bit of popularity over here in the UK. Yeah, I think a lot of people had mini disc players mm. and it was the MP3 player that kind of came around later on and destroyed that. But they had like NetMD, which was like a Sony's attempt at kind of putting MP3s on mini discs. It's really weird. It got it got very complicated, didn't it? Yeah, but I mean... The... Data discs, do you remember them? Yeah, I never yeah. used them, but I remember the com- them coming along. Uh, but the thing about mini disc is, I mean, it was really cool because it essentially gave you CD quality audio that you could record. Because before that, we used cassette tapes. And yeah, that sounded yeah. horrible. And uh, even if you look at like the highest end mini disc that they had back in the days, um, they're basically quite high to the level of um, you know these high res audio recorders now. Yeah, like Sony, you know, they were really ahead with that. I, don't, no, I used to record everything on like long play too. So <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> you get about eight hours on a disc. The quality, sounded yeah. awful. But why are we talking about mini disc then? Well, um, Sony they've stopped selling players, which is remarkable. They still were, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they're still selling black mini discs, so, yeah. <laughs> so they're still making those. But uh, there's a company, Tiak, okay, in Japan, and they're actually still making and producing video uh, mini disc players in 2019. And there's a picture here of their deck. It's kind of, uh, it looks like a CD and mini disc kind of dual player. Load of controls in it. That looks really sexy, actually. Oh, yeah, and I bet it kind of supports all the latest mini-disc kind of technology, you know? <laughs> the hot new mini-disc standards, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's cool that they are still making that. I mean, I wonder how many people are still using it. There's got to be a few. Uh, I mean, you know, people are still using cassette tapes, but mini-disc is a weird one, though, because it doesn't sound any different to an MP3 or a CD. No, I, I just like having the small little kind of square things. Yeah. And it's, uh, I just got a vinyl player, so I want to get an old... Sony mini disc separate on there, yeah. But they're still quite expensive if you look around. I've been going to cash converters to see if anyone's <laughs> put one through. I think we did have one in the studio at some point, but let me look at look. Uh, someone's beat you to it, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you know what's an interesting point about that is do you think people are starting to miss like the physicality of stuff? Yeah, totally. That's that's yeah. exactly what I miss. Like that's why I've started getting into vinyl again because I go out to a shop and pick yeah. it up and go, oh yes, and then put it on. And there's something cool about having a music collection, even the game library as well. I mean, you know, zeros and ones on a hard disk is not. Do you remember tangible. those little mini disc stack units that you used to get, like CD towers? Oh, really? I never saw those. Oh, they were awesome. Yeah, yeah straight on eBay as soon as we finish <laughs> up here. Right then, so if you want to find out more about that and the rest of this week's stories, we'll put them all in the show notes at theretrohour.com. The same place that you will need to go if you'd like to win a free copy of Freefall 3050 AD. We've got about 30 Steam codes to give away, so you'll find the question and all the terms and conditions on the front page of our website at theretrohour.com. And right now, we're going to cross to Australia to catch up with this week's special guest, the legendary Tony Takushi. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest, a true veteran of the video games industry. Welcome to the show, Tony Takushi. Welcome to the Retro Hour. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Dan. Good to see you. Good to talk to you and Ravi. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, before we get into um, you know stories about CMVG and Mean Machines and Sega, that you know, there's so much we're going to cram into this hour that we have with you. Um, but I did hear a little rumor that you used to be an accountant before you got into the video games industry. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't add up. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and avoid the bad puns. Many years ago, that's really where I kicked off. Made my parents very proud. Very traditional Greek thing. Um, so I did. Uh, was at school. Learn. I'll, we'll get into the game side of it shortly. But basically basically studied to be an accountant for about a year and a half, maybe. Yeah, did the professional exams, flunked them terribly. wasn't for me. And I got to wear a suit and travel on the tube every day to Old Street, East London. So, no, I really don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you first get into video games then? What was the kind of influence or the step that you took? 
Oh, God. Uh, it would have been around 19, bleh, 78, 79. Went to visit a cousin of mine. And in the corner of his room, he said, here, have a look at this. And it was a Tandy TRS-80. Obviously, I've been playing video games, Space Invaders, whatnot. I think it was 77, 78. And seeing these games, my, it blew my brain, of course, back then. You know, it was it was nothing like it, nothing comparable, guys. And I saw this TRS-80, and he said, look, you can play Galaxians on it. Oh, my God, Galaxians at home. You're kidding. So, again, I was, I was overwhelmed. I, I had to have this machine. So I started looking into it and saw there was a bunch of other systems too, the Commodore PET, et cetera, et cetera. I saw the Commodore PET for, um, had a six-inch green phosphorus screen, cassette deck, um, and small integral keyboard, 632 pounds, bloody fortune back then. And again, I was doing the accountancy stuff, earning 240 pounds a month, Wow. peanuts you know you know i was a lackey lowest of the low just doing the leg work anyway long story short um got myself four or five god knows six jobs through the summer and my dad finished off the final portion of it i went out and bought myself a commodore pet i think it was around september 79 um and that really was was the kickoff i, I saw there were games on it and i thought i had to have every single game on this system so I was writing letters, chasing magazines, phone calls uh, to America, even on my paltry salary, um, and started building this crazy big collection. Um, and that really was the, the essence of where it came from. And then um, that then bloomed into other areas. I was in Tottenham Court Road, central London, um, going through a computer store, chatting to some guy. And he said to me, wow, what you're doing is amazing. You've got a great collection. I'm, I'm writing a book, a technical book. You should come and talk to this publisher. I said, what, what? He says, they're just over the road. It was VNU who were doing PC, PC World, PCW at the time. Yeah. You know, the industry leading volume. You know, it's massive, that magazine. Maybe 200 pages a month. It's huge. So when the side, they introduced me to um, the publishing arm. They were doing a joint venture with Pan. And that's really where um, it really started to take off. The first thing I did in the industry were articles for a magazine called Microcomputer Printout, 1979-ish onwards. I did three massive articles reviewing hundreds and hundreds of games for Commodore Pen, Vic 20, Commodore 64, and Atari. So, I mean, that really was the, the way it kicked off. That's how I got into industry book machine. Uh, wrote a letter to a magazine. They asked me to write a series of three articles, then got introduced to the books, the best software guides, which I wrote for Pan. Reviewed around 2,500 games, and the Vectrex and ColecoVision game consoles were in, in those books as well. So that really, I, I learned my trade, a lot of my trade at that time. Well, I imagine just getting a, uh, you know, getting a pet at home. So I remember that kind of looked like Darth Vader's helmet, didn't it? The Commodore pet. It looked so futuristic <laughs> at the time. It it's must... a good analogy. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> it must have felt so, magical, like so futuristic having this machine at home, though, that could essentially play all these arcade games in your house. To be honest, it was overwhelming. You know, like a Zonko, I sat there and I, I was typing basic. I let machine code. And I sat there and I thought, God, this is amazing. I can do anything on this um, 8K RAM six inch green phosphorus screen and cassette deck <laughs> yeah it, it, it was revolutionary at the time it was you know it was an amazing feat to have that machine um and it was you know the earliest of early early days for home computing to be honest it was i think back to it now and it might you know it's overwhelming to think that that's where i was at that time i was just very lucky worked extremely hard and was very very lucky well when you started coding from home kind of what games were you creating or, or small programs well like most people I tried in the early days writing um, basic stuff in basic. Of course, you get the, you get your syntax errors, or you go to the magazines and try typing in uh, these massive long listings. I think I did that maybe one and a half times before I um, pulled my hair around and slashed my wrists because it was just too painful to type in all these listings and get them wrong. So I um, initially started doing uh, typing in the listings, and then I went to college before I before I, I did the so I got machine seventy nine. Went to North East London Polytechnic to do a nine-month foundation course in accountancy, but don't hold that against me. And met a guy there in the computer lab who introduced me to 6502 uh, assembly coding. And that was really the, the paradigm shift. That's where the light bulb came on. I thought, my God, this is fast, but my God, it's hard to write. Obviously, it's monomics uh, assembly code. Um, so that was uh, a, a revelation. And then I, I was only interested in machine code. I, you know, the, I remember the first time in the Commodore Pet, I wrote a small routine to draw a line across the top of the screen. Just a simple loop, render loop. 
and it was like, oh my God, I've written a piece of machine code. And I had to keep going from there, really. So we started off with basic, moved on to machine code, and uh, ended up knowing a lot of very talented guys who helped me code. But we'll come to that, I guess. Well, I mean, some people may not remember it, but there was a magazine called Big K that you worked on oh, in God, the yeah. early 80s too. I mean, how did you get the job there and what was your role on, on that mag? Oh, God, Big K. Um, trying, to think, trying to think back in terms of the timing. The first mag I wrote, I wrote for, actually, I'll give you a quick brief. So first mag, I, so I was at VNU doing the books for Pan. I would go in there that number of times. And when I was there, they were talking about setting up personal computer games, PCG. So I would, they put me on a software consultant. I'd go in part-time. It suited me because I was doing other stuff. And um, I was there one day, and this guy turned up at PC Games in, in VNU in central London, Tottenham Court Road, I think it was. Tottenham Court Road? No, it's Oxford Street, sorry. And this guy turned up in this green two-piece bean suit, and he had a pair of Jesus boots, blonde, blondish hair. And he, somebody's walking around the office, and they said, he's the new editor. I said, oh, who is he? And they said, oh, his name's Chris Anderson. I said, oh, okay. Is he from the games industry? And then, from what I recall, they said, no, no. He's from Dorset Radio or some kind of radio thing from um, down the southwest, Cornwall Way. Hmm. I thought, oh, that's bizarre. Why is this guy coming onto a games mag? Of course, Chris was a really bright, talented guy. It ended up creating future publishing, Imagine. I think. Was it Imagine in the US? I can't remember. Um, but that's where he came on board, and that's where I met Chris uh, initially. And he was the editor of the mag, very bright guy, took it to some good places, but CVG was too entrenched. So the PCG ran for a year, uh, and then they closed it, unfortunately. It was doing pretty well, but it wasn't doing well enough. They closed it, and I'm trying to remember how I got in contact with Tony Tyler. He was the editor on Big K, and Richard Burton was the assistant editor. Um, maybe I contact on street, I can't remember. I remember going to the building, IPC building, which published Big K. I think it was Waterloo. And um, there were a really bunch of very talented guys, but very unusual, very left of center in terms of the way they looked at the industry. They gave me a lot of slack. So I did some really interesting interviews. I did the, the big Jeff Goatbuster piece and the software superstars while I was at Big K. Um, I got a lot of the industry, leading industry guys around the table with some, an interesting chat. So, I mean, that's I started off PCG, moved to Big K. Big K lasted about a year. And then I did work for computer and video games with Tim Metcalf, who was the editor back then. Um, and some, again, that was an awesome experience. That they gave me, Tim gave me the opportunity to do my own comment column, which also did on PC games and a review page. And did that for about a year and a half, two years. I can't remember, something like that. That was, an, that was just amazing. I really enjoyed my time at all the mags, and CVG was right the crown of it, I guess. Well, I mean, it was that the was, biggest. Yeah, that, that mm. was at the biggest multi platform magazine at the time. It was, you know, everybody read CVG. When you first got to CVG, was it mainly covering. Home computers then, not not consoles. Well, consoles were relatively relatively new at the time. I'm trying to think how how the overlay, the crossover came, because I was doing some consultancy work for Virgin Mastertronic. Was that before or after? I'm not sure, but basically, um, no, I think that came after CVG. I think so. It was early days for the Sega Master System, eight bit side, and of course that was a revolution too. There was the eight bit NES from Nintendo and the Sega Master System MS one thousand. They called it in Japan. Uh, so there wasn't that much console stuff, to be honest, uh, in the early days. There was a lot of the 8-bit stuff, Amstrad, Commodore 64, VIC-20. And obviously, the more and more interest grew on, onto the console side. So I did my bit at the back, on the back page, my review page and comment column. And then Tim um, Tim Metcalf, the editor, said to me, the console side's really taking off. Would you like to have, uh, would you like, you know, basically like to take care of it or do a section about it? And that's really where Meme Machines came from, The the um, in the middle of the mag of CVG. It started off as two pages, maybe grew to four, can't remember. But it was hugely, hugely popular. And to be frank, I was all over it. Well, Meme Machines obviously went on to become so popular. Um, I mean, was it hard to find news and information on the Japanese consoles? Oh, um, yes and no. <laughs> because I was, you know, I was besotted. I was absolutely mad about games, um, particularly in those early, early days. Uh, yes, there wasn't much around, to be perfectly honest. And this was really before the, the specialised shops opened up in North London and Central London offering import games. So I was literally sat on the phone ordering this stuff from Laox, which was like a major chain store. So there were Japanese mags, which I used as reference, plus any, any and everything I could possibly find. I would literally make calls to Japan, these stores, cost me a fortune. 
and ask for the latest game systems to get them shipped from these major stores. And of course, they didn't speak English or they spoke very bad, very bad English. So I'd be on the phone, be pushed pillar to post, department to department, sitting there saying, please hurry up. This phone call's costing me a fortune. <laughs> but I eventually managed to do it. I got the PC Engine. NEC's PC Engine shipped. I broke the first review of PC Engine uh, for NEC and uh, did the same, I think, for Neo Geo, possibly for Mega Drive 2. These were the first reviews in Europe, and people were going to do lally for them. Uh, about a year after I did the review in, in of the PC Engine, I rang and spoke to the guy at NEC just to push them to release the damn system. It was so popular. And I got through to the guy in charge of um, electronics for this particular area. And I said, hi, Tony Takushi, I'm ringing about so-and-so, the NEC PC engine. And he paused, long pause. And he goes, so you're Takushi? I said, yes. And he goes to me, I was tempted to put a bloody contract out on you. You've caused me so many hassles with people chasing me <laughs> to, for this console. And I said, great, job done, mate. <laughs> they never did. They never released it, unfortunately. Well, what did you think of the PC engine when you first saw it? Oh, God, it blew my mind. When I saw the pictures, to me, again, very short story on how I actually got the very first unit. I bought all the rest. There, I said to Frank Herman, I said to him, he's going to Japan to talk to Sega. He was the chairman of Virgin Master Tronic, was the chairman of Sega as well. I said, Frank, uh, can you do me a favor? Can you get me this console? It's called PC Engine. He goes, sure, son, no problem. Um, Frank's very no, lovely guy, very affable. And uh, so he turned up, he went to Japan, he came back and he wandered in my office. I was at Sega, it was early, about whatever, 6, 6.30 in the morning. It's dead quiet. And he wanders over and he drops this box onto the table. Oh, my God, I'm just talking to you, brings back memories. And he goes, there you go, son. <laughs> I said, what? He goes, that's the PC Engine. And I got you a few games too. I said, oh, thanks very much. How much do I owe you? And he goes, ah, no, don't worry. Put it on expenses. Call it research. I looked at him and smiled. And, you know, it was a magic moment. So I opened up the, the box had two games, maybe three games, Drunken Master, like a massive Kung Fu fighter, massive characters, um, Necromancer, which was like an RPG thing, and Victory Run, the driving game. And my brain, you know, life was never the same again. You know, R-Type on the engine. It was, it was way, way ahead of the 8-bit systems. Well, it, was, um, it was great to read about those as well. Because I mean, you mentioned the Neo Geo before that as well, and I remember like that would be the, the chat of the school playground. Like, this is what these rich kids in Japan have, and we, <laughs> we'd never have a chance to ever own them. I mean, do you think that was kind of the appeal sometimes for readers? I think that was part of it. The Neo Geo was, the, I'll be honest with you, it was the toughest one because I had to fork out, oh my God, how much? Five hundred and seventy pounds. This was twenty five years ago, whenever it was, thirty years ago. God. £570 for this console, and the games were £200 a pop. So I actually ended up, they ended up distributing. So I think, yes, a part of it was this is an arcade machine in the home with arcade joy pads. There were huge boxes, those joysticks. Uh, that was a big part of it. And I got to know the distributor, Luther de Gale, um, who did Konami distribution, and he also did some Neo Geo cartridges. So I built up a fair collection. But the yes, it was very expensive, very lustful. Most everybody wanted it, understandably, too. Well, how much reader mail were you getting at the time? Was there, like, bags and bags of the mm. stuff coming in? Well, because of the way, because of that energy and the way that I wrote, if you, read, if you, have, you know, if you get a chance, have a look at the columns. Uh, the, the mail bay went through the roof. Obviously, the kids were getting really het up by the comment column, and they were also feeding back about the games. And I flipped you through some of the bits and bobs I pulled together for a scrapbook in terms of some of the letters and, the, you know, just you know, just really crazy stuff. They put a blue picture of me on the common column and kids were writing in saying, is Tony, does Tony, Tony Takushi really have a blue face? <laughs> uh, just really, really mad stuff. Um, the kids got really enthused. I really, I loved writing the stuff. I didn't realise, I didn't realise just how lucky and privileged I was at the time, to be honest. Um, I had a whale of a time. Um, and the kids got very het up. But then I just wrote from the heart. I've always written the way, written what I feel. You know, the way I talk is the way I, that I write. That's what Tim said on CVG. And um, that energy just was in the right place at the right time with those particular magazines. I love those because you did send us through a few, um, you know, like you said, a few cutouts from from the letters pages back then. And the, yeah, the, the amount of people <laughs> got riled up. I mean, did you try and get a rise out of them sometimes? <laughs> no, to be honest, I, it was flattering at the time. But I, I would read it and chuckle. And it was um, just stop and think for a minute. In terms of what we do every day in our lives, our ability to to communicate and to touch people, whether it's good or bad, is limited is really limited and to have a platform like cbg and the editor saying 
go go figure go write an article every month go write a review of whatever you want and write a comment column i was never ever edited or told not to do this or that i was given a completely free hand i didn't realize just how lucky i was and because of that and the the way that i wrote the it was engaging i guess at the time and they they um there's a safer better some people got very head up some people loved what i wrote some people hated it and that's okay you know that was the whole point and you think back then, I mean, it's not like today where you leave a comment on a website. If people wanted to, they had a strong opinion. It was a lot of work. You had to write a letter, print it out or type it or write it, take it to the post office, put a stamp on it. So it was, yeah, it was a big yeah. deal for them, for the kids. But again, they were, the, you know, they were really enthused. I was too. It was a different, a really different time. People today still love games and games is much more, games are far more commercial today, obviously. It was more, it was a different time and place different attitudes different values different processes uh, the passion with the kids is still was and still is there today um but again today it's more more publicity seeking genuinely hand on heart i can say to you it was what i wrote was how i felt and um i'm sure people do that today too but there's also an element of look at me i'm on social media Whereas for me, it was just saying I had to tell the world about these amazing games, be it Jeff Minter, MSX from Konami, Neo Geo, Mega Drive. I was passionate, still am. I've got in the garage right now, I've got 50 boxes full of games, T-shirts, hardware, prototypes, special versions, whatever. I've got a copy of Elite that Colin Fuage from Telecom Soft who were the publishers, brought to me. So he turned up in my flat one day saying, here's a copy of Elite Tone. You, it's a special version just for you. It's got one million credits. And I've still got that in the box, pristine. Oh, wow. Um, so I've got a ton of stuff in the in, I've built up over the years in the garage from that experience, that enthusiasm. I'll flog it on eBay one day. I'll do a YouTube video or whatnot and get that out there so other people can enjoy it too. Well, you even had a tips hotline at one point. Oh, my God, yes. That, that was a guy called Bruce Everest. So, yeah, he, Bruce approached me and said, uh, would you like to do a tips hotline? I said to him, what the hell's that? And he said to me, look, X, Y, Z, you can do this, earn some extra cash. It's not particularly hard to do. So I said, all right, give it a whirl, see how we go. So I did that. I can't remember how long it lasted for, six months, a year. But um, to be frank, by the end of it, I don't, the a lot of the money I got from that paid the deposit on my house. Um, not the house, but it's a, you know, a good portion of a deposit. So there were just things that came up. I made catalogs for distributors, wrote for a French magazine, Micro News, wrote for EGM in America, Electronic Games Mag, one of the, the biggest over there. So there were a lot of opportunities, a lot of doors opened up because of the, th- the type of things I was doing and the relative profile um, through that time. It was very exciting, really different times. One thing I always wondered back then when I was reading the magazines, because, I mean, you know, the magazines were so important back then in this pre-internet era. It was like the only way you could find out games news. I mean, how much did the, the publishers and games developers like kind of like schmooze with journalists and like magazines? Did they kind of like look after you and take you to events and treat you to dinners and all that kind of thing? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there was the, the various items spring to mind. So one was a company called Alligator Software. That's where Tony Crowther began. Uh, Tony Crowther wrote some of the best games on 64. Um, at the time, Tony worked at Alligator originally. They put on a little Beano for us and took us over to the Black Forest, Germany, and did um, remember being on the ferry coming back. It was cho- really choppy seas, and I, I couldn't sleep in the cabin. It had no windows. It was awful. So I, I spent most of the night literally hanging onto a Tempest coin op um, down in the the main area for about two or three hours playing many pounds worth of Tempest. So it, it, there were various jollies, Amstrad, uh, Talk of the Town in Leicester Square, God knows what they call it now on the corner. Uh, also things like Dominic Diamond. Uh, when I was at Sega, we'll come on to Sega shortly. But Dominic Diamond was the host on Games Games Master. Yeah. And, um, you know, very strong character. And he flicked me a letter. I was European product manager at Sega Europe. And he flicked me a letter saying, hi, Tony, this is Dominic. I want to have X, Y, Z get them to me by end of day but it was the essence of the letter and I looked at this and thought who the hell is this guy to sit there and dictate to me so I just looked at it and said no I'm not responding to this that's not how you ask for stuff that's not you know it's rude it's aggressive it's unpleasant there's no need for it so um, I went and spoke to my boss and said to him I'm not sending this stuff to him he goes we well, must send it to him he does a tv show it's really popular I said to him I'll send them to him but I'm not sending it sending them to him today Anyway, long story short, his manager got on the line. I said, uh, no, I'm not doing it. Hung up. Uh, about 24 hours later, 
had a letter courier delivered from Dominic signed, which I've still got in the boxes outside somewhere, saying, terribly sorry, Tony, uh, my manner was off, I was a bit of an ass, um, and basically apologised. So there were pluses, there were minuses, there were lots of celebrities. Um, I got to meet David Crane, the guy that did little computer people back then, yeah. got to know a lot of the coders. It's just really amazing times, Dan, um, exciting times, just really privileged, really lucky. It must have felt a really exciting time to be in that industry, though, because it was everything was kind of being done for the first time, I guess, wasn't it? A lot of it back then. Yeah, it was very fresh. It's the same with the, said the reviews I did, for example, in Big K. I did those big round tables, and I was asking questions that um, a lot of people really weren't bothering to ask. And same with the Sega. The Sega explosion. The business grew from twenty million in the first year. By the eighteen month, within twelve months, eighteen months tops were turning over five hundred million pounds that year with Sonic 2. So there was, it was unprecedented. The company had exploded at Sega from 22, 27 people through to 150, 160 by the time I'd left, left the company two, two and a half years later. So it was phenomenal growth. There was nothing, you know, nothing like it. I was dealing with Sega Japan, Sega America, Sega Europe. Um, I was learning a massive amount uh, commercially as well as, here's the thing, up, up until the point where I was doing the magazines, I was a games nut. I built up all these thousands of games and whatever. I've got 20 or 1,000 games in the garage and all these boxes from all over the years, all these different platforms. So I was a games nut. I was a games enthusiast. It doesn't mean you know about games, to be honest with you. And when I went in, went in at Sega, the thing that really um, happened, I learned my craft. Commercially, I learned my trade. You know, I learned about marketing, sales, product. I visited Sega Japan, visited the, the Sonic teams. Uh, all the other games teams visited Taito, Namco in Japan, was was wined and dined and learned about a lot about um, the Japanese culture. Went to Sega America and learned about mach the machine that the Americans built and, you know, the way the Americans work. So all of that was, was really paradigm shit from this enthusiastic kid, basically. That's what I was at the time. <clears throat> Well, just so, before we um, well, just before we get a bit more into Sega, I mean, just kind of wrapping up the the CMVG era. Why did you leave then, on what kind of seemed like a bit of a high? Because I mean, you know, your column was really popular. What kind of happened there? Okay, so CVG was there for about a year and a half or so. They brought in a new editor, Tim Metcalf, had been the editor up to then. Tim was brilliant. They brought a new guy on board, and um, he wanted to make certain changes. And the way he wanted to bring them in wasn't the best. You know, everyone, every new editor is entitled to make changes. It's their job to make the magazine successful to their mind and what works for them. And I don't think he was too keen on what I was doing. And I didn't find out about it from him either. I found out secondhand. I can't remember all the details, but basically I found out secondhand. He didn't. He wanted to do something different with the magazine, which he was perfectly entitled to do. What I took exception with at the time was that the way he did it, he didn't talk to me directly. I found out secondhand. So... He brought in a new column, my bit wound down within two months, I think it was tops. And it was time to move on, basically. Oh, you um, edited the Sega Club newsletter as well. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I found <laughs> a few scans awesome. of that online recently, and it's like, I've completely forgotten about that. <laughs> so, yeah, when I was at Sega, they said, we want to do this this magazine. I'm thinking, okay. They said, you're, you're a writer, so you can do it. So, okay, Muggins here got lumbered with it, but it was it's turned out to be a labour of love. Basically, it, was a review, it ran for three, it was a two-pager. The very first one was a two two or three-pager fold-out, basically. And they had some game reviews and some com competitions and whatnot. So that was ran for, I think there were four issues of it in total before S Magazine kicked off with Future Publishing. And as part of that, I started doing these um, Sega Club because the kids could join Sega Club and they got membership cards and various whatnots. And I could would visit them at home with prototypes, Space Harrier or whatever it was, and pray to God that they didn't whoop my ass because <laughs> I played them head to head. <laughs> I turned up at these houses and the room was packed, packed with kids from schools. Tony Takushi's turning up to go head to head with Joe Bloggs. So I'd sit there like a Zonko the night before hammering the game if I had the time. And think, dear God, please don't let the kid beat me. Most times I could heckle him and win by, by being unfair. But more often than not, they they bought my ass too. So it was a bit of fun. Really, I really enjoyed it. The kids really enjoyed it. Um, didn't really have the time to keep doing it, of course. You know, Sega got more popular. Uh, that went to the side. There wasn't time to do that kind of stuff ongoing. But again, it was a really exciting time. Sega Magazine came out from Future. 
uh, that was a more obviously more of a full blown thing. Skewed kind of young, I think. The early issues. Well, you started working for Sega in 1991. I mean, your, your role there was mm. European product manager. How did you get in the door with Sega then and get get the job initially? Oh God! So um, when I where do we go? So originally, um, Sega distribution was done by Virgin, Virgin Mastertronic. And um, I was doing, I'd written some games at home in my bedroom, like most coders back then, 8-bit games and 16-bit. And um, I was going into Mastertronic, Virgin Mastertronic, Portobello Road, I think they were based in. And uh, as part of the the contract, I'd go in, submit builds to them, have a chat about promotions, whatever it was they were doing. And, of course, my reputation from CBG, um, the, the directors wanted to talk to me. So they were saying, there's lots of opportunities, son. Sega's taking off. This was when Virgin was doing it before Sega bought them out for about 30-odd million, I think it was. And there's loads of opportunities. Do you want to come on board? So really, the essence of it came from the early days, my programming, going into Virgin Mastertronic. The director's pulling me aside saying the business is going in through the roof. Sega became hugely popular in a very short period of time. Did I want to come on board and start doing X, Y, and Z? And initially I said, well, no, I just wanted to run the Sega Club. And um, so I kept at arm's length. But the business took off. They pulled me aside a second time, basically, when I was back in London and said, you need to come on board now or we're going to have to find somebody else. So I had to make a decision. I was living in Cornwall at the time, bought a small cottage a few miles from Land's End. Uh, It's a lovely place. Um, So I took the plunge to the right. Business is going really well. Let's give it a shot. Came back to London, took on the job as European product manager, um, and it just exploded. The business exploded. I was on a very fast learning curve, dealing with the various territories, uh, supporting marketing and sales. We were doing advertising campaigns. So, I mean, that was the essence of it, really, Dan. What was it like during that period where it all kind of blew up? And did you get one of those, you know, Sega bomber jackets that everybody had? <laughs> oh, my God. So here's some stories for you. So one day, walking into the office at Portobello Road, before we bought the, the massive building in Earl's Court, walking up these spiral stairs, my boss, Barry, or the product director, I heard him talking about a jacket with the marketing girl, Susanna Chong, I think her name was. And he's going, no, no, it won't fit me. I'm a fat. I thought, what? So I'm walking up the stairs, got to the top, was walking over to Barry's desk. In his hand, he had this massive jacket, this beautiful blue jacket, bomber jacket, Sega jacket. And he threw it at me. He goes, here, you have it. It'll fit you. And I looked at the seat. Woof, caught it in my hands. Looked at it. I thought, oh, this is seriously cool. It's a Sonic 2 one. It was the prototype. It's a one-off. There is no other like it. So it had real leather sleeves. The ones they sold in the, st- in the shops were about 80 pounds. And they were plastic. They're lovely jackets. But the arms were made of plastic. Uh, they weren't the leather and the patches, uh, I had two, one, one patch or two patches on the arm, and the others were in the pocket. So this was the very first one done for merchandising purposes. And I looked at it, I said, yeah, okay, if you don't want it, Barry, I'll ha- happily have it. And as we talk literally right now in this cupboard next to me on, inside, wrapped in plastic, pristine, is that same jacket. Oh, That's where I meant, Dan, when I said I've got stuff from those days. I've got special Leslie, the, um, the, the girl that worked on CVG, moved over and worked at Sega. And when we're at Portobello Road, I'm talking to you, I remember it vividly. She would, I'd say to her, what's new? We've got any new merchandise? She goes, yeah, come and have a look. She'd go and open up with her keys, open up the storeroom. She'd take me in. i go, what's in there? What's in there? And she'd open up all these boxes. i said, oh, that's really cool. She'd say, okay, you can have it. And she'd throw it at me. So <laughs> I've got these boxes of, you know, specially painted master systems. Never seen light of day. When I did the Sega mags that you talked about earlier, the very first ones, one of the competitions I ran was for outrun brass key rings with outrun and uh, they're given away as competition i've still got one of those 10 brass outrun key rings wrapped in plastic pristine in the boxes in the garage just a ton of that stuff um from that time which i really treasure but you know it's sitting in a box gathering dust so as I say one day I'll, I'll i'll open a box a week and put it on youtube and then flog the stuff on ebay on a week per week so you know there's a lot of people out there i think will get a lot of pleasure out of it for me it's gathering dust i love it but it's just a hoard again massive box of t-shirts sega t-shirts one-off special promotions um merchandise i've got a uh, holdalls packed with sonic pens calculators one-off rucksacks um sega technology institute where they did sonic 2 will come to that shortly um, when I visited there, they had prototype games which were never released. They weren't good enough by Sega standards. And I've just got merchandise from there. They did cup holders, all sorts of 
amazing, amazing uh, merchandise. Um, which I, I was just when I when I left Sega, I walked into my boss Barry's office and I said to him, "Look, um, is that okay if I take my stuff?" And he looked at me and he smiled and he goes, "Well, what stuff?" I said, well, "I've got bin liners full of games." He goes, "Yeah, no problem." I said, well, "What about all the rest of it?" And he goes, "Well, what is it?" I said, "There's games, romp cartridges, prototypes. They're old. You know, this was a, after Sega re- reached its peak. It was it was going downhill." Um, but he, he says, "Okay, it's yours. Take, help yourself. Don't really care." So I walked away with a ton of one-offs and um, really special stuff, which I treasure, have treasured. But I think it's time, probably time for the world to enjoy it too. I mean, when you when you started there in 91, I mean, that was kind of the, the start of that, that wave that Sega ran. I mean, it must have been the most exciting company in the world for work to work for at that time. I mean, right in its heyday. Yeah, yeah it was. the um, by Over the period that I was there, that about three years, there were around 220, 200, maybe as much as 250 titles. I handled Sega brand, not third party. I'll tell you about third party in a sec. So and through Sega brand, we had about 250 titles passed through in terms of Game Gear, Master System, so Mega Drive, Mega CD, uh, Sega Saturn. Sega Saturn was, was really my, my parting legacy, I suppose, in terms of handling the lineup in particular. Sega brand department grew from me as a one one guy band through to I think maybe six staff and we had our own QA, we started our own internal development. So it was a massive one to three year period, massive increase in turnover. I got to write the official Sonic 2 guide for Scholastic Books, they approached me. And that's still going, that's still around apparently. It's like uh, 92, 93 that came out, I can't remember. Um, so a lot of opportunities. And again, like Sonic, here's a story for you. So I, I used to go in in the morning, used to get in very early, and um, Sega Japan, SOJ, would send through ROM images. Of course, this was the early days. Initially, I had just this little ROM chip burner. It would burn one chip at a time. So I'd, I'd open the zip file uh, to get to get the game file itself, wherever it was, 128K, I think it was, or 64K, whatever it was. And then I'd hook up the this one chip burner to the PC and burn the image onto one ROM chip and then mount that ROM chip into a PCB game board and plug that into a master system or a mega drive. And the day that Sonic arrived, it was literally the first copy of Sonic in Europe. It lands in my office because I used to distribute to the territories, France, Germany, Spain, from uh, the UK. And I sat down and burnt Sonic onto all these ROMs, put mounted it, switched it on and just like, oh my God, my brain just went into overload. It was Sonic, Sonic 1. I had the only copy of Sonic in my sweaty palms in Europe, sat in central London. So there were moments like that, just magic moments where, you know, it's special. It's one, you know, one in a lifetime experience. Certainly going to Sega America. I used to visit Sega America pretty regularly, see how those guys worked and talk to them about marketing distribution. I used to go over to the CES show, Consumer Electronics Show. I used to go to that um, what, twice a year, can't remember basically. But again, used to have that was an amazing experience. I so lusted after that getting to that show, and with the success of Sonic Two, when I turned up with Barry, they laid on these massive, absolutely friggin' friggin' massive white limousines, stretch limos, to pick us up from the airport. So just fantastic memories. They took us to the Hyatt Regency five star AAA to do the 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 global Sega conference. Again, got you know badges, paraphernalia, marketing blurb from all of that stuff. Just. Amazing hotels, amazing experiences, traveling first class, business class with Virgin. Very privileged, really, really lucky. I'm going to sit down and write a book. I made the decision to write a book. You guys have encouraged me to, the, the reviews with the Retro Gamer and yourselves with a podcast, to sit down and reflesh out all those experiences and share them with people. It's funny you mentioned mm. CES because I was watching a clip on YouTube um, just yesterday. I think we showed it on our Facebook page um, that was mm. of CES in 1991 on the Sega stand and it was the, the premiere of the, the Game Gear and Sonic was showed yep. there as well for the first time. I mean, it, it must have when you first saw Sonic, I mean, did you know that this was going to be a game changer? Um, yes and no. So yes, I, when I saw it, it was, I knew it was something different, something fresh and exciting. But the, the Sonic's got a bit of a history to it. So I met with Al, when I went to Sega America, SOA, Sega, America, Sega of America, Al Nielsen was the marketing guy. And Sega, with Mario Nakayama, the Sega president in Japan, had ordered, dictated, bless him, that uh, Sega come back with a, an equally compelling character. 
So the brief was given, and I think they worked it between them, Sega Japan, Sega America, marketing side characters. I think they went through something like 60, 50, 60 iterations to get to the final Sonic character. I've still got the style guide. I've still got all those images, the, the Sonic Bible from a lot of those early days and the Pantones that were colored, used for marketing, etc. So there was a massive evolution of character with the Sonic, with Sonic, um, it was dictated we had to compete so it was always going to be something special with that that kind of resource i'll talk we'll talk about the sega japan visit shortly visiting the teams uh, so it was always going to be something special and they had sega had the resources they built one two three maybe five internal teams they called them internal divisions so that there was eight bit teams 16 bit teams when mega drive arrived plus the coin op guys downstairs in the sega building so Yes, not surprised. I used to love the shows. Initially, I was I walk around in wonderment trying to log all these games. I ended up with massive lists of five, six hundred games on Mega Drive and SNES, just to keep in touch with what the opposition was doing and what we were doing overall. There were so many games coming out. Well, the biggest launch at the time was Sonic Two. Um, can you tell us about Sonic Tuesday? Oh my God, when I begin. <laughs> um, I'm talking to you, I'm just thinking back to those moments in, in Portobello Road when we were talking about the marketing plans and did, did the launch, I think in Oxford Street, can't remember, we did some launches for it on, on the day of launch, Sonic Tuesday. Um, there was a, a massive, massive uh, amount of hype and build up and anticipation for the launch. And again, I'm getting the ROMs over while it's being developed, the early versions, which I put into the book, the official Sonic guide for Scholastic that I published. So there was a huge buzz, a huge amount of pre-orders. I think we sold something like one and a half million copies of Sonic 2 in Europe. And don't forget, this was this was at the early cartridge days of whatever it was, 45, 55 pounds a cartridge. So this was, you know, significant revenue, significant sales and anticipation. We did a lot of, a lot of marketing. There was a lot of uh, late nights and worries that, you know, we're doing the right thing. The, the game pretty much sold itself, to be honest, in the end. Because Sonic 1 had been such a huge success. There was a lot of anticipation. So I ended up going to Sega America to visit the Sonic 2 team. So I went to the main building and uh, they said, you have to go out house. They had a separate division, separate area. In the same, comp, effectively, the same block of, same block area where Sega was, but a different building. And I had to get a swipe card. It was called the STI, Sega Technology Institute. And it was run by a guy called Hector. What was his name? Ex Namco guy. Um, but basically, he headed up STI, and they did a number of new, fresh projects, which they were testing with marketing, and that's where the Sonic 2 team were based. Sonic 2 was produced in America with Yuji Naka, obviously heading it up. Hmm. So I've still got pictures again in the boxes outside. Turned up, got my swipe card, Hector walked me around. There was a game called Jester, I think. Um, he showed me various games, and then I got the opportunity to go in to visit the Sonic 2 team. I remember walking up, swiping the card, walking inside, to this massive, massive room, and on one side of the wall, on one side of the room, they had this these massive maps. The whole wall was covered with them, and they were really the layouts. They would hand draw the layouts of them, and, um, and pin them up on the wall. Play these were the play areas ultimately that would go in the game. So I got to meet the team. There's a lot of Japanese people there, artists, coders, whatever, uh, plus a few Americans. And but Yuji wasn't there. Yuji Naka wasn't there. So I made a comment at the time. I says Yuji around. And they said, um, no, no. And there's the, the guys were sort of looking away. I, I did, you know, something wasn't quite right. Couldn't put my finger on it. I said, is everything okay? And they said, well, yeah, he's not here. So everyone's quite happy. I looked at the guy and I said, what do you mean quite happy? He said to me, Yuji's, uh, so I'll be polite, basically a very hard taskmaster. Oh, wow. And um, he's not here today. So the team are quite chi quite chilled. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess, you know, he had a creative vision and he wanted to create it his way. And I, that's my guess on what, that's, what that scenario was ultimately. It isn't easy. They were under insane pressure to get that game out on time. And the first two or three times, I think I rejected, believe it or not, I actually rejected Sonic 2. There were overnight calls from Sega Japan saying, what the hell is going on? I hadn't signed off on production. My boss, Barry, had needed me to sign the forms to say yeah, we were happy to take it for Europe, and I hadn't signed them. And the main reason was that it was really buggy. I could crash it within probably 30 to 50 seconds by doing X, Y, and Z. So I said, no, no, we can't release this. And they said, well, we'll do running changes. So there were two, two phone calls. Frank eventually visited me in my office and had a conversation. 
and the agreement was, as with most games, you basically release it as best you can and do running patches to update it. And that's really what happened. It, we went out the door, huge success. We did further production runs. We were then, then moved over to Sonic 3. And Sonic 3 was different. How could we possibly top Sonic 2? Mm-hmm. And um, there was talk about doing these massive cartridges and doing this and doing that. And I said, in the end, I said, why don't we just do um, break the game into two parts? And Barry said, okay, send an email to Sega Japan, suggest it. So I sent it over. And they ended up breaking the cartridge into two bits, as you, you may remember, where you plug one on top of the other. That was towards, for me, that was heading towards the end before I left. Um, and for me, what the future was like the the isometric three, the RPGs, action RPGs, what we were doing. So I pushed them very hard, but they were very expensive. They were big ROM cartridges, very large, two megabytes, one and a half megabytes, plus battery backup. Well, you know, you think of this time, and obviously they're riding high on the success of Sonic 1 and 2, and I mean, you know, there were a few missteps as well, stuff that was innovative technology, but not necessarily, I guess, in terms of commercial success, stuff like the, the Mega CD and the, the 32X. I mean, what was your opinion on, on those add-ons then, and were they hard to, to get out there and market? Oh, God, we had real problems with the Mega CD. So the Mega CD obviously was, was, a, was, a, was a slight step backwards. Nintendo had hardware scaling on its sprites we didn't have hardware scaling so mega cd was part of part of the solution um, for that gap in terms of leadership in the marketplace so and obviously we had mega cd but it makes it we mostly we filled those cartridges with music um, maybe some obviously more more levels more graphics but we i remember the marketing campaigns we used to go to pinewood studios and do the tv commercials for Sega and Mega CD, we're sitting there in the commissary having lunch, and these guys walked in with prosthetics. They're, I think they were filming Alien 3 at the time. So I sat there having lunch next to this guy with, anyway, yes, use your imagination. <laughs> it was an experience. <laughs> Pretty weird. Um, sorry, digress. Where were we? Put you off your lunch, I bet, seeing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mega CD was, was a misstep, essentially. It was. It was too expensive, 229. Again, I, I, part of my brief was to test all the games coming in. So I set up the Mega CDs with triple biases. There were switches on the side to switch between UK, Japanese, and US. Those Mega CDs um, were collector's items. But the games themselves didn't really cut muster, is the truth of it. And uh, it was too little, too late. Too expensive. 32X was an interesting one. I was sat in, I won't say who was there, to save some, to protect the innocent, shall we say. I was at Sega America, sat, I was sat in the corner of a room, and there was a marketing meeting going on. And they were saying, oh, we're doing 16-bit, and we have to move to 32-bit, and Nintendo's announced this. Someone came through the door and said, uh, we've done, um, Nintendo's released the Nintendo 64. We've picked up news about XYZ. And the person, very senior person in the room, said, OK, what can we do? Can we say XYZ system has got 64-bit technology? And the, the marketing guys are looking at him going, no, <laughs> no, you can't. Anyway, long story short, I think it ended up being the 32X. that The plug-on was like a, a short-term step. Uh, they, they, they did, I can't remember, maybe a dozen carts, maybe 18 cartridges for it. And for what it was, it was pretty cool. But again, too expensive, too little, too late. The cartridge market was getting to saturation point in Europe. And with the policy they had, they had returns policies, whereby the the stores didn't sell them. They could ship them back to Sega. We ended up with massive warehouses. So the the writing was on the wall in many ways. I tried to find ways to get around it, whether we could reprogram that ROMs. I talked to Sega Japan, the technicians. But once the mask, their mask ROMs, once they were burnt, they were burnt. There's nothing we could do with these massive inventories. So software and hardware issues towards the end, it was getting harder and harder. And retail were not enamored. Um, we weren't getting the right products out in the right timeline at the right prices. Well, I mean, around that time, obviously, it was when the, the Saturn was in development. Actually, I think it was released in Japan at the same time the 32X came out in, in Europe, if I remember correctly. Um, I mean, you mentioned the Saturn was kind of the last big project that you worked on at Sega. What was your mm-hmm. opinion of the Saturn when you saw the hardware and what was it like trying to promote that product? Oh, God, it's such a thrill. I can't tell you. So it was like the next big thing. It was, I think it was 32-bit 32 32-bit machine. So I was looking at them. The last thing I worked on at Sega was the lineup for the, the first 12 months of launch. So we're looking at driving games, Daytona. Obviously, the arcade franchises were no-brainers. Virtua Fighter, uh, Daytona, uh, Clockwork Night I loved. It wasn't a coin-up, I don't think. 
And yeah. the uh, video card was fantastic. I remember seeing video on the uh, Saturn and it just looked really good. FMV, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, you remember? Yeah, there was a cartridge or something you plugged in, wasn't it? In the back, yeah, I think, yeah. And, um, again, Rev- again, again, these were great ideas, really products of the time. Um, my guess is that it was probably a uh, pricing strategy and also some damage had been done at retail that the retailers didn't want to take stock um, or would only take limited stock in terms of their personal exposure. And that went with the retail chains as well as the individual suppliers, distributors. The Saturn was a lovely, lovely, lovely piece of kit. And it's funny, I've just got myself a GPD XD+. Plus. So I'm running a lot of those old Saturn games on the emulation on it. And it's just bringing back, I was playing Daytona 2001 yesterday. And it just brings back so many memories. Those games were, you know, just head and shoulders above. They were they were real CD-ROM games by the time we got to Sega, uh, Sega Saturn. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, drink, I you mentioned before mm. about an arcade in the home and like the Saturn really was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I actually, for me, I've been an arcade nut. And, and my worst, I've had around six or seven arcade machines in the flat in London. In fact, I was almost killed by an arcade machine. Quick one for you. You'll enjoy this. So I had, um, what's the first machine? The first machine I bought was a Tempest um, Cabaret <clears throat> from Ruffler and Deeth when I was doing the magazine stuff. And then the second one was a machine called Radar Scope, which was, apparently was the first machine that Miyamoto, the guy that designed Mario, worked on when he joined Nintendo. So I had to get this machine. I was getting another machine in, Mac 3, a laser disc machine, a mon- massive monster of machine, Mac 3. But Radar Scope was a, was a MIDI cabin. It wasn't so big. And I thought I'd be able to get it down the stairs. It always took two people to get them into the flat. But I thought this one's quite small. I'll just get my shoulder behind it and just bring it down slowly, step by step. Again, what a zonko. So <laughs> I, got, I managed to turn it, hopped over the banisters, got behind it, got my shoulder underneath it and started turning it. As it came around the corner, it missed the step and slid. So, you know, behind it is that moment of terror where you, you, you're looking at this thing and thinking, it's not going to stop. Oh, God. <laughs> so it's sliding down the stairs. It's pushing me. I, tr- I couldn't hold my feet. It's moving down. The radar scope sliding down the stairs, picking up more speed. I'm underneath it. And I'm, and then I'm, my feet hit the bottom of the stairs, and then I'm waiting any second for this machine to come down crushingly on me, and it stopped. Oh my God, it stopped! So I turned my face up and looked, and just as it came down the stairs, it had moved maybe like two or three inches and got wedged in the step above my head. So I was always killed by by a radar scope arcade machine. It's something out of a to Looney Tunes cartoon or something, that isn't it? <laughs> it's a moment of terror. I'm still there. I'm talking to you about it, and I'm still there. It's, but crazy stuff, crazy stuff like that. You know, I had iRobot, I had uh, Mac Three, uh, Tempest, Us versus Them. These were laser disc games. Dragon's Lair, Space Ace, Cobra Command. I was, you know, that plus all the game systems. I was absolutely besotted. Eat, lived and breathed. I learnt my trade then. That's where I learnt my trade. So you were a great supporter of the new on DVD system and you released a great game which was called Freefall 3050 AD. How yeah, was that developed all... and uh, what did you think of the new one as a concept? Oh, God. So at the time, the new one in conceptually was ahead of its, ahead of its time. So it was basically um, a, a DVD player, Panasonic. A lot of the major Japanese corp- corporations bought into it. <clears throat> and the chip for it was designed by Silicon Valley um, company, uh, Project X. And uh, the new one chip was multiprocessors. So there were four processors running on one chip, much like the, the PlayStation sort of, basically. And if they, they, they were basically, they ran late on it. They commissioned half a dozen games. They had 12 meg of RAM plus this blindingly fast MPEG-2 decoder. So Jeff mentioned it to me. I said to him, look, I've written this design, which I'd love to, to do. And just said, look, let me, let me introduce you. Go and have a conversation and see if it'll fly. So I flew to the US, met with them, gave them the, the pitch, the design. They said, all right, we'll ship you a couple of dev kits. So we do the prototype. And if we like it, we'll commission it. So we did the prototype over many months. It was very early days. The tools were very crude. The library is very limited. And did the prototype. They commissioned me to do it. So I got a team of six or seven guys together. I wanted to do something different, guys. So with Free for 3050, um, I thought, how, uh, this, there's this mechanic. I loved Pilot Wings on the Nintendo. And it's a first-person shooter come Free Fall. So I did mission-based levels as well as pure shooter levels. Did the game. And unfortunately, it was launched. The new one... Uh, chip was launched in some players but it was too little too late and again the price was quite quite high 
the game got some coverage, not an awful lot. And when they launched the new one, we developed the game with an, literally with the Nintendo 64 controllers plugged into the dev kit. And we were assured when the new one DVD player launched, there would be analog, play, analog controllers like the Nintendo 64, which we'd been using. They launched it with these plastic D-pads, standard D-pads, and the game was just painful to play. So I found that really hard, to be honest. You know, I jumped on a plane, took a copy of the game, presented it to various magazines. Not many would look at it because it was a new one. It wasn't a dedicated games console. But the ones that looked at it liked it by and large. Got eight, 80, 8 out of 10, 80% from game fan, and had some amazing, amazing feedback from the guys that played it on Amazon and um some of the indie mags too. I mean, if, if people want, there's a website, www.freefall3050.com, freefall3050.com. Go and have a look. The videos are there and it goes on sale on PC at the end of January, first week of February on Steam. So people can, I genuinely would really love to know. To me, that mechanic, there's not. There's nothing quite like the gameplay in Freefall. Look at the videos for yourselves. You know, grab a copy. It's not much, whatever. It's budget three, three, uh, three pounds three dollars have a look at it go to the website freefall3050.com please at the bottom and give me your feedback i really would like to know i remember reading you know a few like online reviews about about that game at the time when it came out and like you said because it was on the new one not many people got a chance to play it but there was a lot of reviews saying it was very groundbreaking i mean why why have you decided now to bring it back like 18 years later as a a pc game yes (laughs) i've had that in the vault that's been locked on freefall 3050 it's been locked in the vault to be honest i had an email from um, somebody that, that approached me after it was released on new, new one saying, do you have it on other formats? At this time, I produced it on the very first Xbox console, very first one. And it was 97, 99% complete. But Microsoft announced they were shifting to the next generation of Xbox. And there was zip interest from publishers. A byproduct of that Xbox version, which ran at 60 frames a second with much, much higher res textures, was that we had um, a PC version. So I thought, well, PC, the, you know, Steam was around, but wasn't as developed as it is today. And when there wasn't Windows 10, which for me was the, the key difference about releasing it now. So I had this email a few months back saying, why don't you release it on, P- on PC? Uh, it runs really well under Windows 10, no, no real combat issues. I thought about it, went back, booted it up, ran it, and it ran perfectly. Runs beautifully smooth, 60 frames a second. It, it was just such, such a rush so intense to play there's nothing quite like it one of the levels has a battle cruiser i don't know if you guys remember a game called r-type yeah and one of the levels there was uh this big ship you had to move around the ship in 2d shooting at the, the bits and bobs of it to destroy it and i had the idea of doing that in 3d with this massive battle cruiser you're falling through this environment you have to free fall around the ship taking out the turrets destroying the engine uh, blowing up the core and then reaching an exit gate so you know really simple mechanic but done beautifully in 3d in freefall and again one of those videos is on the website freefall3050.com go have a look please um i wanted to do something fresh what for me one of the biggest things is that why would i spend two months two years of my life just regurgitating what everybody else does give give the players something fresh something different I imagine everyone listening to this now is thinking, oh, I'd love to give that game a try. And uh, very generously, Tony, you've actually um, given us a few copies to give away if people want to try it out on Steam, haven't you? Yeah, I'll send you um, about 30, co- 30 codes through for Steam, and you guys will post um, on the website in terms of the details. And I hope your, your guys really enjoy it. It is something different, something really intense and fresh. So all of that will be in this week's show notes and on our website, theretrohour.com. And, uh, of course, it's available to buy as well, isn't it, through Steam, if people just want to jump on and get a copy straight away? Yeah, of course. They can. It's, 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 the budget was relatively limited. It's only two, $2.99, I think, £3 max, or £2 or $3 in US. Um, but, yeah, it's have a look. I think you'll, you'll more than get your money's worth out of it. It's great fun. Well, Tony, we could talk to you all day. It's been uh, wonderful getting your stories. Um, I know it's early in the morning in Australia now where you live, isn't it? Yeah, it's past <laughs> nine in the morning. But oh, it's great. I've really enjoyed talking to you too, Dan. It's been just bringing back those memories. It's just, it's been a blast. Thank you so much.